This is part two of lecture nine. So in the first part, we saw that others impact our performance. And sometimes we feel invisible. We feel like nobody's really watching us, and that can also lead to impaired performance. So this feeling that no one is watching us can also um, have different uh, consequences, and that's what we're going to talk about right now. So um, if others are present, and especially when we become part of a very big group, like you see over here, a huge, gigantic group, we can feel completely invisible. And we can also lose our sense of individual awareness. And the moment we feel like we are basically hiding in the crowd, our most asocial and ugly part of our personality usually comes out. And there's plenty, plenty of examples of this. Um, here you see one example. This happened on January 6, uh, 2021. Uh, supporters of President, uh, former President Trump infiltrated uh, the U.S. Capitol in Washington. And this was a protest against uh, Trump's defeat in the 2020 uh, elections uh, against Joe Biden. And um, Trump basically... Uh, rooted for his supporters to take action, and they took this very seriously, a gathering together, and uh, was this huge riot, uh, very extreme. It led to the evacuation and also the lockdown of the capital, and uh, five people died in this uh, basically quite um, a terrorist attack of, of Trump supporters uh, in uh, Washington. Very extreme group behavior. So around the same time, in the Netherlands, things were heating up as well. Um, here you see what happened uh, after a curfew was imposed at the end of January 2021. People, after 9 p.m., they could not you know, go on the street anymore. This was an additional measure against the pandemic. This was announced uh, in the news. Riots broke out in several cities, including Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and also in Tilburg. And this was also very extreme violent behavior against uh, uh, against the police, and uh, there was uh, so millions of dollars of basically damage in stores and uh, f uh, bicycles that were destroyed, uh, cars that were being burned down, very extreme uh, behavior. And um, these are two examples of what happens when we lose our sense of in individual awareness. This is what we call de-individuation. And this is what happens, what, or what can happen, if we are in the presence of a very big group. We start losing our individual awareness, and this has several uh, consequences. Um, it leads to an increase in obedience. So that's basically also what we saw uh, by the storming of the Capitol. Like people, th this group of Trump supporters, th they were, of course, very bummed out down uh, by the fact that their president uh, lost the election, they started to be increasingly uh, uh, obedient towards their uh, leader, uh, which was uh, former President uh, Trump. So increased obedience, also increased conformity, basically some the two big problematic um, uh, human behaviors that we discussed in the previous uh, lecture, and also decreases in accountability. So that means that we no longer feel personally accountable for what we're doing. And this typically leads to very impulsive, emotional, irrational, and antisocial uh, behavior. And this has been studied uh, in uh, many ways, also uh, by studying like societal uh, uh, happenings like uh, the, the ones that I just uh, discussed with you. But also in studies, actually one quite cute study on, uh, during Halloween. So Halloween is actually a very interesting time to study de-individuation because uh, people come together in big groups and they also wear masks. And what happens when you wear a mask or you cover your face, you become more anonymous. And this also you know, leads to a, an increased sense of de-individuation. De people cannot see you anymore, right? So Halloween is an interesting uh, time. And during Halloween, this study was conducted on kids. So it was quite a... No, uh, sweet study, I think. Um, studying the individuation, but not with this very extreme behaviors I just uh, showed you. So in this study, uh, children uh, were invited to come by with their Halloween costumes, and they could enter a room. This room was empty, and there was a bowl of candy standing there. And the instructions were very clear. You can enter the room and take one piece of candy. And then there were several conditions. So the first condition was sometimes the group, uh, the kids were in a small group with other kids, and sometimes they were alone. So this is also a condition of de-individuation, right? If you're alone, you are an individual. If you're with the group, you're more uh, a part of that group. So more de-individuation. And then the second condition, which is also an interesting one, I think, uh, sometimes the kids were asked their name, 
before they entered the room, and in other conditions, they were not. And also, saying your name out loud is also an act of individuation. You remind yourself that you're an individual. You also you know, notify the, the authorities, basically, the experimenter, that you have a name, that you are a person. So these are basically two conditions in which individuation is, um, de-individuation is being uh, impl impacted. So let's take a look at the results, and you see a graph in which, uh, on the y-axis, you see the percentage of children transgressing. So basically taking more than one piece of candy. And here you see the impact of the different uh, conditions. So you see that, um, first you see the, the groups of kids that were alone, that entered uh, the room alone. If they also stated their name, then uh, almost everyone followed the rules and only 7.5% of the kids took more than uh, one piece of candy. If they were anonymous, so they did not say their name and entered the room alone, already 20% of the kids took more than one piece of candy. But then we, we turn to what happens when they are part of a group. Then if they are individuated, uh, uh, then 20% of the kids uh, took more than one piece of candy. So saying their name uh, really definitely sort of uh, impacted uh, their uh, behavior. If they were anonymous, so they did not say their name, and they're in a group, then the majority of the kids transgressed and showed, uh, you know, a behavior that was not in line with the rules. So here you see actually a cute little study uh, on this quite severe effect of de-individuation. So um, de-individuation also definitely played a role in I think social psychology's most infamous study, and I, I bet you know it, and maybe you've been waiting for it, but here it comes, it's the Stanford Prison Experiment. And this experiment is conducted um, at Stanford University uh, in 1971 by Philip Zimbardo, a social psychologist. Um, and this is, uh, was a study on obedience, a topic that we, of course, uh, discussed in uh, Lecture 8. And... Um, Basically, what Phillips and Bardo wanted to test was uh, the power of the situation. And he uh, recruited male participants to take part in what would turn out to be Definitely the worst experiment of all time, if you ask me. Um, so what he did was, in Bardo's group, uh, they built a mock prison, a fake prison, in the basement of the psychology uh, lab uh, of Stanford University. And he paid studies, uh, he paid the participants to play the role of either a guard or a prisoner and which role the participants would take was determined by a flip of a coin, so it was really random. Nothing was rigged about this. So just to be clear, for actual participants, no actors here in, in, in this study, and they were either a guard or a prisoner. So I will now sh uh, show you uh, a video clip with the actual footage of the Stanford Prison Experiment. Um, I do want to say beforehand uh, that there are some, some trigger warnings here because you will see violence, you, see, you will also see abuse. And if you start feeling uncomfortable or, or if you just, if you, maybe you already know the study and you don't want to see it again, I can completely understand. You can just fast forward this video until you see my face again. <laughs> um, because the details that are in the study, they are not so important. So it's just for you important to know the big picture, which is also described in the book. So if you read the book, then you also know enough. But I know that some of you are also interested to see what actually happened there. So for those of you that, you know, have a strong stomach and you want to keep on watching, then uh, here you see uh, some footage of the Stanford Prison Experiment. The Stanford Prison Experiment is possibly the most famous psychological experiment of all time. An insane role-playing game gone horribly wrong thanks to nylon stockings, fire extinguishers, and a sadist nicknamed John Wayne. So what really happened behind those prison walls? Here's a look at the untold truth of the Stanford Prison Experiment. The experiment begins. With funding from the U.S. Office of Naval Research, Dr. Philip Zimbardo began the Stanford Prison Experiment in August 1971 to study the effects of prison life and examine the power dynamic between inmates and guards. As he later wrote in his book, The Lucifer Effect, Zimbardo wanted to know, if you put good people in a bad place, do the people triumph or does the place corrupt them? He began by putting an ad in the paper for volunteers who would be paid $15 a day to participate, about 93 bucks in today's cash after inflation. After selecting 24 guinea pigs, Zimbardo and his assistants converted the basement of Stanford's psychology department building into a makeshift prison, then flipped a coin to decide which test subjects would be guards and which would be prisoners. It would turn out to be a fateful decision. Welcome to prison. 
The experiment began when real-life cops pretended to arrest the students playing prisoners. They were hauled to the actual Palo Alto Police Department, booked, fingerprinted, and then blindfolded and tossed in a holding cell. Once they were transferred to the fake prison, things got a lot worse. The prisoners were ordered to strip naked, douse with a spray, forced to wear dress-like garments without underwear, and nylon stockings as hats, and fit with a chain locked around one ankle. The students playing guards were also encouraged to make up their own rules, leading to 17 strict guidelines the prisoners were forced to live by. Prisoners were only allowed to refer to themselves by number, and guards would randomly wake them up in the middle of the night with screeching whistles and force them to exercise. Zimbardo even got into the act himself, playing the prison superintendent, where he always sided with the guards and encouraged them to create a sense of fear among the inmates. But the prisoners soon began fighting back. The Prisoners Rebel On the second day, the prisoners went on strike, removing their hats and the numbers from their uniform and blocking the cell doors with their cots to keep the guards from entering. That's when things got even darker. The guards on duty called for reinforcements and used a fire extinguisher to force the inmates away from the door. After forcing their way in, they removed the cots, forcing inmates to sleep on the floor, and refused to let the prisoners eat or brush their teeth. They also threw the ringleaders of the insurrection into solitary confinement and forced others to clean toilets with their bare hands, while spreading rumors that some inmates were informing on the others in the hopes of getting preferential treatment. Finally, the guards stopped letting the prisoners use the toilets at all, forcing them to do their business in buckets, which they weren't allowed to empty, turning the whole fake prison into a giant open sewer. Prisoner number 8612 loses his mind. Less than 36 hours into the experiment, Douglas Corpy, a.k.a. Prisoner number 8612, apparently lost his mind from the stress. One of the ringleaders during the rebellion, Corpy had been thrown into solitary confinement and was a target of harassment from the guards. According to Zimbardo, Corpy began screaming and crying, although the doctor and his staff initially thought he was just faking it in an attempt to escape. Eventually, they let him out, fearing for his mental health. Corpy later claimed he faked it all, telling SF Gate, The breakdown I had was a manipulation to get out of that damn experiment. But in a documentary made by Zimbardo, Corpy told a different story. It was an experience of being out of control both of the situation and of my feelings. Meet John Wayne. One guard in particular was noted for his sadistic tendencies. His real name was Dave Eshelman, but the prisoners called him John Wayne, though in fact he consciously modeled himself after the villainous prison warden from the Paul Newman movie Cool Hand Luke, going so far as to use a southern accent when speaking to the prisoners. Eshelman orchestrated all sorts of terrible hazing, forcing the prisoners to play leapfrog so their gowns would ride up and expose their privates. He once ordered two prisoners to act as Frankenstein and the Bride of Frankenstein, forcing them to embrace while saying, I love you. As his final infamous act, Eshelman forced several of the prisoners to simulate intercourse. Tellingly, the other guards didn't stop his actions. I started to get so profane that, uh, and still people didn't say anything. According to Eshelman, though, he's not really sadistic at all, but actually a good guy who was simply trying to expose the evils inherent in a prison-type environment. He told Stanford Magazine, I set out with a definite plan in mind to try to force the action, force something to happen, so that the researchers would have something to work with. From Eshelman's perspective, any blame lies with Zimbardo. Nobody was telling me I shouldn't be doing this. The professor is the authority here. You know, he's the prison warden. He's not stopping me. Things fall apart. Over the course of less than one week, five students playing prisoners had to be released due to severe psychological issues caused by the abuse of their guards. Perhaps the worst was the case of prisoner number 819, who broke down weeping. When Zimbardo allowed him to rest in a nearby room, however, the prison guards lined up all the other inmates outside the door and forced them to chant, prisoner number 819 did a bad thing, over and over again, until the poor guy was reduced to a blubbering wreck. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. He was eventually replaced by a new guinea pig, prisoner number 416, who was so horrified by what he saw in the prison, he immediately staged a hunger strike in protest. Guards responded by tossing him into solitary confinement. The experiment had gone off the rails, and the only man who could stop it had lost all perspective. As Zimbardo put it himself, I had become the superintendent of the Stanford County Jail. That was who I was. I'm not the researcher at all. Luckily, someone with perspective showed up on day five. Zimbardo's then-girlfriend, Christina Maslach, was an assistant professor at Berkeley. After showing up to help with the experiment, she was appalled to see the prisoners chained together with paper bags over their heads. She confronted him that night. We had a long argument. At the end of it, he then decided, this is it, I've got to shut down the prison. And so then the next day, everything stopped. The experiment was supposed to run for two weeks. It had only lasted six days. Aftermath. <laughs> 
Shortly after the experiment ended, the horrific uprising in Attica prison took place, thrusting Zimbardo and his research into the spotlight. Researchers are still arguing about what it all means. Zimbardo himself has said it goes to show how normal people can be turned evil by circumstance, telling the BBC. The study is the classic demonstration of the power of situations and systems to overwhelm good intentions of participants and transform ordinary, normal young men into sadistic guards. Others aren't so sure, as some critics think Zimbardo unintentionally skewed his results with his methods, which may have attracted participants who are much more aggressive and less empathetic than the general populace. Plus, Zimbardo wasn't just a scientific observer. He actively participated and even encouraged violence and brutality, corrupting his data in the process. Tellingly, when psychologists conducted a similar experiment in 2001, they remained observers, and the guards never got anywhere near as aggressive as John Wayne and his cohorts did at Stanford. The significance of the Stanford prison experiment came into question again in 2004, when a group of American soldiers tortured and humiliated Iraqi prisoners at Abu Ghraib prison. Zimbardo was called to testify as an expert on behalf of one of the defendants, who claimed the system encouraged the guards to act violently. Zimbardo agreed, saying Abu Ghraib was a Stanford prison study on steroids. The defendant still received eight years behind bars, however, which some might consider an ironically fitting epilogue to the saga of the Stanford prison experiment. Okay, so um, now you've seen it, or you skipped through it, and uh, you know that this was a, a very extreme experiment. And I think this study is maybe as famous for basically the shocking footage, but also for the criticism on it, because this study has been criticized over and over again, especially recently, actually the past 10 years, more criticism uh, appeared. Um, because so many things went wrong, so many things went wrong. Actually, everything went wrong. So let me start with the obvious, ethics. You know, you think this is an ethical study to conduct? Of course not. It's completely unethical. Uh, it also took way too long. It was way too intense. Uh, participants felt like they couldn't, couldn't quit. They were harmed, uh, actu actually harmed physically, emotionally. It was just a terrible study. It was such an unethical study to be conducted. So again, today, this would never be possible. But more things went wrong. And that has to do with the design of the study. So first of all, um, Philip Zimbardo recruited participants. And in the text of the flyer, basically, in which he, he recruited the participants, he said, this is a study about life in prison. And we now know that these words, this is a study about life in prison, was actually sort of a self-selection of male participants that were above average in aggression. So this, afterwards, this has been studied. And if you use these words, then you attract participants that are already above average in aggression. So it's selection bias, right? So recruitment, that was something that went wrong. Scenery. You know, he built a mock prison. It was not really an objective setting anymore. Very clear. And that also everything constituted or, you know, build up to demand characteristics. And demand characteristics is basically when participants can guess what is expected of them. So what is the hypothesis of this researcher? How am I supposed to act? Especially in an ambiguous situation, as we've talked about before, people look for cues on how to behave. And they see a prison... They are, you know, recruited on a prison experiment. They are a guard. So how am I supposed to behave? Hmm, let's see. It's pretty obvious, right? So demand characteristics definitely played a, played a role. And sometimes uh, in a certain moment during the experiment, Philip Zimbardo, the experimenter that was supposed to stay objective, he gave instructions, clear cut instructions to the guards on how to behave to make it a little bit more intense, to, you know, lead to... Make, make bigger consequences. So he instructed them on how to behave. It's not, nothing, it has nothing to do with studying um, natural human behavior. It was just following orders, basically, of the, of the experimenter. Uh, and then finally, exaggeration. Because even though Philip Zimbardo worked so hard to create this, this, this very intense study, um, only one out of three guards showed this very extreme behavior. Actually, two out of three guards uh, didn't go along with it. Um, and one, uh, one out of three guards actually openly said, no, we cannot do this, we cannot treat um, and this, the prisoners uh, in this way. But uh, Philip Zimbardo sold the story, focusing on the one-third, so one out of three guards, that did show the most extreme behavior. And that's basically because this, this story just sold better. Uh, and that's, that's not really ethical also when, when you're talking about how to do good research. He sold a story about how, how horrible human beings are at the very core. 
But he rigged it. It's just, uh, just a false uh, study. So that might be reassuring for you to know that you know, it, this actually was not as bad as Philip Zimbardo made it look like for a long, long time. At the same time, though, I do want to end by saying that the de individuation is certainly a problem. And we saw this, uh, for example, with the storming of the Capitol and the, the, the riots uh, with the, the, the curfew that was imposed in the Netherlands. So we, we do have to do something about that. And when people feel invisible in a group, really horrible things can happen. So what is the solution? It's individuation. It's also something that we already saw, saw with the Halloween study, right? You have to remind people that they are still individuals. You have to remind them that they can also be watched and that they can be held accountable for what, what happens. And this is actually something that society is already doing or, or the government is doing that, using nudges, for example, placing cameras in um, uh, areas of public transportation, like with metro stations or train stations. Uh, there's cameras, um, and oftentimes these cameras don't even work. But just the fact that there are ca cameras and people feel like I might be watched and I might be held accountable for what I'm doing right now, helps to decrease uh, the individuation and also mirrors help. So if there's mirrors in public spaces, then people see themselves and just seeing yourself doing something can sort of wake you up and make you feel like, wow, okay, I'm now awake from my de-individuation coma and I am actually an individual and I do not want to be uh, so asocial and I want to be like a, a person that is you know, a good human being and, and decent and uh, follow the rules of society. So this is something that you can do to decrease uh, de-individuation.